Welcome, friends and foes, survivors and killers. Let's sit around the campfire together and talk about Dead by Daylight. Specifically about one of my favourite killers, and one I've got a lot to say about. Elliot Spencer, better known as Pinhead or The Cenobite. It's been a good few months since the Hell Priest graced our game with his presence, and his arrival did not come without controversy, because, well, this is Dead by Daylight, was it ever going to? We all know how vigorously I covered the release of NFTs made in collaboration with Boss Protocol and the Hellraiser rights owners Park Avenue, featuring behaviour model they created for Pinhead, a disaster which soured many people's opinions of the release, mine included. I felt somewhat guilty about buying him and all the cosmetics for him on day one of his release, because I learned what my money was supporting, and I've resolved not to spend a single penny more on future Pinhead content, until I know, for sure, the money goes to Clive Barker and not Park Avenue. But ignoring how dodgy the circumstances are around his release, I've always loved Pinhead in our game and I still do. And it's not just because of the character or how faithfully he was adapted. When played properly, Pinhead's power provides something few killers do. A sense of incredible control over the pace and state of the game. There's a lot you have to do right to make it work, but when it all comes together, Pinhead can allow you to put the game overwhelmingly in your favour at basically any stage, in a way only rivaled by top tier killers like Nurse and Blight, or dedicated snowball killers like Oni or Plague. Pinhead provides a mix of 1v1 and 1v4 power that has a low margin for error on both sides. You've always got a lot to manage with this killer. If you mess it up, you're going to suffer at the hands of good survivors, but if you can keep on top of everything, and capitalise on the survivors when they eventually put a foot wrong, then you'll tear their souls apart. A lot of people will tell you that after his add-on nerfs, Pinhead is a bad killer. I even heard some people say that engineers found it necessary to play him effectively, and the nerf it received was enough to render Pinhead a dead killer. Those people are wrong, and I'll be honest, they probably never knew how to play him in the first place. But fortunately, I'm here to help. So let's get started. Have such sights to show you. There's two parts that you need to get used to if you want to play Pinhead correctly. Using your possessed chains properly and managing the lament configuration to maximise chain hunt uptime. You won't win consistently with Pinhead if you can't use both elements of the power effectively. So we're going to start with the possessed chains and then talk about the lament configuration. But before we go any further, I'd like to talk to you about today's sponsor, Sleepy Spaniel NFTs. Working hard to bring you amazing pieces of art fit for the 21st century. Have you ever seen a picture or a piece of artwork and thought to yourself, damn, that looks really nice. I'm now willing to pay unreasonable amounts of internet monopoly money to purchase an image that looks slightly like it. Well, if you have, you're somehow not the only one. And Sleepy Spaniel NFTs are for you. For just 40,000 Ponzi coin, you can buy one of these wonderful pieces of Sleepy Spaniel artwork created by combining the acute social awareness of a Silicon Valley tech bro and the boundless artistic creativity of a hedge fund manager. Just look at these professionally made and highly unique pieces of art. If you don't think these are worth the money, you don't have to take my word for it. I'd like to introduce to you Kirk Rockwell, the CEO of Sleepy Spaniel NFTs to put any of your doubts to rest. Hi, Kirk Rockwell here. I'm the head of the team here at Sleepy Spaniel NFTs, and I'd like to address some harmful misinformation you might have heard about what we make here. I started off just like you, a useless sack of shit wallowing in my own misery with nothing to my name but the Harvard jacket I got before dropping out, the luxury condo my parents gave me for my 25th birthday, and some homophobic comments on my private Twitter. But Sleepy Spaniel NFTs changed my life, and I'm here to change yours too. Just look at my grandma! Yeah, she told me she wanted a new pair of slippers for Christmas, but you should have seen her face when I showed her the HTML of a picture of a monkey that I spent $6,000 on! Granted, she didn't look very pleased, but she'll thank me in a few years if the starving rats in the walls of the nursing home I put her into haven't gotten her first. Some detractors have claimed that the Ponzi coin mining and the NFT minting processes burn 400,000 acres of Amazon rainforests for every NFT we mint and sell, but don't worry! For every tree we burn, we plant two in Roblox Gardening Simulator to replenish the ecosystem. Yeah, they don't produce oxygen, but they grow much faster, and our employees love that they don't have to go outside to see them. Other NFT companies have come under fire from disgruntled 
with customers claiming that their selling practices boil down to a pyramid scheme where the only income you get from the art is generated from coercing new people into the scam. But we are different. We work under more of a Pythagorean business model where the square of the sum of our profits is equal to the square of the sum of the number of dogs and funny hats we sell. There's even been some very serious allegations of art theft made by artists living and dead claiming we stole their work to create these NFTs. To those artists, we have this to say. So what are you waiting for? Click the link in the description to join the official Sleepy Spaniel NFT Discord server today and begin your adventure into the blockchain. By clicking this link, you allow Sleepy Spaniel NFT to access your personal data, including, but not limited to, your computer password, IP address, home address, work address, dress size, shoe size, daily schedule, bank details, and worse fear. Thanks, Kirk. Now back to the video. The primary power you'll be actively using is the Possess Chain, which you fire in two parts. The first part places a portal some range in front of you. The longer you charge the power, the further it goes. But you're slowed to 3.67 meters per second while charging the ability. Once the portal is placed, your point of view teleports to the portal that you make and you can fire a chain from it to hit the survivor. Think of it like a nurse blink. Instead of teleporting you directly to the blink location, it shoots out a tiny billy chainsaw from the blink location. If you hit a survivor with a chain, they are incapacitated and rendered incapable of any movement other than walking, and two more chains will spawn targeting them. I'm going to call these support chains. The survivor can either hold their mouse at one button to break these chains one at a time, or push the chains through the environment, which includes Pinhead and other survivors, to break them. If any of the three initial chains break on the environment this way, a replacement chain will spawn and attempt to target them again. It's a pretty simple power on paper, but in practice it has limitless applications. The obvious one being slowing the survivor for a hit. Even a single chain being attached to the survivor forces them to walk instead of run, which denies them many benefits you'd get from running. Vaulting windows or pallets will be restricted to a slow vault only meaning the survivor can be easily grabbed in many circumstances and exhaustion perks predicated on the survivor running, like Sprint Battle Dead Hard, will not be able to activate. However, hitting somebody who's already chained will cause all attached chains to break, meaning they still get the speed boost from Overcome. The most common application you'll see for this slow is to make short loops easier by chaining the survivor near the pallet, forcing them to either stand still to remove the chains and get hit, or slow vault the pallet while chained and get hit or grabbed off it. But in Chase it has many more applications. What I do quite enjoy is chaining the survivor who's camping a pallet but greeds for the stun and refuses to drop it. Once the chains are up, you can either just face check the pallet and swing straight through it, or try to mind game them depending on the pallet. If they're holding M1 and trying to break the chains, they can't actually drop the pallet without letting go of M1 first something a lot of survivors won't realise quickly enough to avoid the hit. So if you can see the survivor straining at the chain instead of trying to break it on the environment, that's something that you can try if you think they're going to fall for it. Alternatively, if they do drop the pallet, they still have to get rid of the chains before being able to make distance on you. So even in the worst case scenario when they stun you, you still recoup some distance while you recover from the stun and break the pallet. It can also shut down distance between the survivor and a pallet or window, so you can sneak a hit before the survivor makes it to the structure. You slow them down on the way to the resource, and catch up and hit them before they can drop the pallet or vault the window. Well, it's kind of weird doing that, because if your goal is to actually make catching up faster, his chains will not do that, they just won't. If the survivor holds W in a straight line, repeatedly training them will actually make the chase last slightly longer than just holding W in turn. This is because the distance stops when you're winding up the chain. For some reason you move at 3.68 meters per second or 92% cyber running speed, which is the same speed as Myers using a stalk ability with no targets. Not sure why he moves so slowly when he's doing this, and it means that holding W for distance can be a very good idea against Pinhead. But he does counter holding W in a slightly different way. While it won't actually reduce the time of the chase, it does deny the survivor the raw distance compared to holding W. Meaning if a goal is to prevent them getting to a resource before you can catch up to them, the Possessed Chain is an excellent tool. If the survivor just holding W into nothing, there's no point chaining. But if they're holding W to try and get to a particular location, chaining them will help that if you can do it quickly and consistently. 
One thing you'll notice as a frustration point in playing Pinhead is how fragile your chains are. They instantly break on the environment, which includes both Pinhead and other survivors who get in the way, which can certainly be a cause of irritation, but it's one that you can happily mitigate. At first glance, it looks like whether support chain spawn is governed by RNG, but there is a clear and distinct logic to how and where they spawn. Despite being able to hit the survivor anywhere on their body, the possessed chain will always attach to the nearest one of these three attachment points on the survivor's model, the waist or one of the arms. If a chain hits a survivor in the side and snaps onto a shoulder, their model will actually pivot like Hag's camera snap to allow the possessed chain to attach cleanly to that location, meaning you can mess with the survivor's momentum if you hit them in the side and auto snap them to the shoulder. The location of the other two chains will be dependent on where the possessed chain connects. For example, a chain hitting the right shoulder will spawn the other two support chains, targeting the centre of the waist and the left shoulder. But regardless of where you hit the survivor with the possessed chain, the support chains will always spawn behind the survivor's back. The support chains will always be the same length where possible, and the support portals tend to spawn at Pinhead's head height. But they can spawn higher or shorter chains if the destination intended would prevent the support chains connecting or cause them to instantly break. And if the possessed chain is snapping onto an attachment point would cause it to cross through the environment and break, a third support chain is instead placed targeting that location. Once you lay out like this, you begin to realise that the chain spawn RNG isn't really RNG at all, but a logical set of conditions and criteria that you can manipulate and control. If you know where you're planning to hit the survivor, you can predict where the support portals are going to deploy when you hit them, and plan your pathing to follow up around those spawn spots. If you bear this in mind, you'll be able to mitigate the ability of survivors to break chains on the environment more consistently than you might think, and you'll be much better at avoiding accidental chain breaks as you walk towards the survivor to get the hit. There are a couple more uses for the chain that become relevant outside the chase, and one that I don't think is used enough is the simple portal for info. Pinhead is one of the few killers with precise information built into his kit, and arguably has better mid-range info collection than any other killer except maybe Twins or Doctor. It's one of the things that make Pinhead surprisingly effective on indoor maps. Being able to check on a generator that's on another floor or through a wall is the kind of thing that's nice to be able to do once in a while. Plus it can help you track down the lament configuration via being on the floor without you having to potentially waste time going all the way over somewhere to check. But the primary use of the possessed chain outside of the chase is disrupting actions. Incapacitation renders you incapable of several things such as cleansing or blessing totems, healing, repairing generators, or using items. It's one of the big reasons Pinhead is so effective in a totem build. Between the innate game delay caused by the element configuration and the capacity to directly harass survivors off totems at almost any range, you'll find hexes tend to stay up much longer than they do when you're playing other killers, so long as you can keep the pressure up. You can check on a boon location to make sure they're going the right way to snuff it out, you can cancel heals, you can even entangle people trying to get a flashlight save, so you can pick up without concern. That might annoy a few people, but you know what they say. No pain, no gain. The most useful part of harassing someone with a chain is to interrupt survivors solving the lament configuration, which is the other part of Pinhead's power that I'm going to touch on now. The lament configuration basically forms a secondary objective for the survivors to keep on top of. It's an item that spawns somewhere on the map at the start of the game and then again every 45 seconds after a survivor solves it. Once the lament configuration spawns, the survivors have 90 seconds to track down and solve it in a 6 second interaction before a chain hunt begins. During a chain hunt, all survivors are harassed by constant waves of AI controlled chains that work like the support chains that follow up on Pinhead's manual power. A wave of three chains will target each survivor periodically at a rate that gets slower the fewer survivors are remaining alive. This means chain hunts become less powerful as survivors start to die, making your secondary power weaker in the very late game or if you choose to tunnel someone. Because these chains incapacitate and slow survivors on contact just like normal chains, this effectively stalls the game almost completely until the chain hunt is over, because being chased during a chain hunt is effectively a death sentence and you can't sit on generators when you're being snagged off it every 9 seconds or so. This means that survivors should prioritise solving the box to keep the chain hunt at bay, but if they do so thoughtlessly, this is an opportunity that you can capitalise on. When a survivor is carrying the lament configuration, you receive a couple of benefits. The survivor themselves is oblivious, 
has to drop their item when carrying the box and cannot get rid of it again until they solve it. While the lament configuration is being solved, you are notified with a unique killer instinct marker and can teleport to the location of the survivor solving it, automatically finishing the solve for them, but summoning you directly to them from anywhere on the map. However, if the Cenobite finds a lament configuration or the survivor carrying it, well, suffice to say this is where the fun begins. Because if the Cenobite picks up the box or downs a survivor who's carrying it, the chain hunt is activated immediately and all survivors scream. Reading the location to you, kind of like Infectious Fright or Tactic Blast, before the box immediately respawns somewhere else. This can lead to some pretty silly situations where you harass someone off the box, down them to activate the chain hunt, hook the survivor and then make your way to the box's new spawn location to intercept whoever's going to solve it, and repeat the process. This is the ideal situation for a Cenobite player, by able to secure back-to-back -back chain hunts to grind the game to a halt, while being competent enough at chasing to make sure survivors run out of hook states and map resources before you run out of generator time. But Pixel, I hear you cry. How can you track the location of the event configuration when it spawns all the way across the map? First, I have to humbly request... Oh, no tears, please. It's a waste of good suffering. And second, just like the chain spawns, there's a method in the madness to the box spawns too. The logic behind the actual box spawns is already fairly well known. It will spawn in any area far from both the survivors and the Cenobite himself where possible. It will spawn at minimum 16 meters from any survivor, and at minimum 40 meters from the Cenobite where possible. Meaning that if you have a good sense of survivor spawns and can navigate a map properly, it can be relatively simple business to track the rough location of the event configuration at the start of the match. Let's use this example game on Coal Tower to showcase how you do it. So I spawn in here and get my bearings. Got main building in front of me, shack behind me, and I spawn on the right side of the map. So given what I know about the layout of Coal Tower, I've spawned about here. Since survivors tend to spawn as far from the killer as the map will usually allow them to, this will put the survivors either at the very, very back of the map, or possibly in the left-hand corner by shack. Since the box is likely to spawn far away from the survivors, it's pretty clear that it's not going to be at the very back of the map, and is very unlikely to be down by the side of shack. But it also can't be too close to me, leaving this area here being the likely spawn location of the box. So I decided to path over to the back of the map, taking myself close to any survivors that have spawned there, while taking a route that's likely to lead me on top of the lament configuration. I hear the box, and then after a quick look around, I eventually do find it. That's the first chain hunt of the match, already activated less than 30 seconds in. A lot of Pinhead players I have known to use Lethal Pursuer to get this information more precisely and consistently, but frankly I've found I don't need it. I can typically find the general area of the box in most matches, and if you can't find it in a quick goes around the area, just taking your first chase there is often enough to make sure you either run into the box during your first chase, or the survivor attempting to solve it will have to do so close to you, so that you can intercept. Being able to chase somebody who's carrying the box and hooks on just as a chain hunt starts can be just as strong as well, finding the box in the first place. Because now someone has to unhook, someone has to solve, and someone's probably about to get chased. Meaning the whole team can be forced off a generator extremely early in the match. Subsequent spawns use a similar logic. When the configuration is about to spawn, the game checks where all the players are and spawns the box 40 meters away from the Cenobite and 60 meters away from any of the survivors, again, where possible. This is one of the reasons I don't like Lethal on Pinhead. While it does help you get the first spawn, it doesn't help you get any of the future ones. Box control is the key to winning games against competent survivors with good perks or a strong rap on their side, and even a couple of chain hunts at the right time and place can be enough to completely turn the tide of the game in your favor. They can easily force a total cessation of progress on generators and stall out the game very aggressively if you can keep chain hunting, giving you an eternity to know their flesh and get some salty comments in the endgame chat. A lot of pinhead players end up using Hoarder, Franklin's, or both to give them a hand with this. Hoarder notifies you if someone opens a chest or picks up an item within 48 meters of you, which includes the lament configuration. 
so a lot of penheads use it as an early warning about where and when the box is being solved. And Franklin's demise forces survivors to drop the length configuration if you hit them while they're carrying it, which sounds great on paper, but if you ask me, I consider that to be a detriment to the pinhead player. Because if someone's healthy and carrying the domain configuration, hitting them with a basic attack will force them to drop it and they'll run away from you. Meaning you have to choose between picking up the box and letting your injured target get a ton of distance, or committing to the chase and risking another survivor picking up the box and losing your chain hunt. You know that dream scenario where you've got one guy on hook, one guy saving, one guy chasing, one guy solving? That's way harder to do when one survivor is W keying across the map instead of being on the ground or on a hook. And a lot like Lethal Pursuer, I honestly think Hoarder isn't necessary on Pinhead unless you're new to him and still learning the box spawn logic. Provided you can keep track of the survivors throughout the trial, you should have a good idea of where the box is going to spawn most of the time anyway. Lethal Pursuer definitely serves a function on Pinhead, but it's ultimately gimmicky. It helps you in one specific circumstance, but when you're burning a whole perk slot on that scenario, I found myself wanting something a little bit more consistent. After all, most of the information that Lethal will give you is information you can just discern anywhere by keeping box spawns and basic game sense in mind. Horder is a bit more useful, I'll admit, as it provides early warning for when the box is about to be solved, kind of like a solve time add-on, to the point that I'd say, unlike Lethal, Horder can definitely be a worthwhile perk slot. Although admittedly, I do not think Horder is as necessary on Pinhead as many people will have you believe, and I don't run it precisely because I know I'll get addicted to it, and let my game sense and map pressure slip to the point that I'll struggle without it. As such, I prefer setting aside my soft tracking perks for one that gives you consistent long range info throughout the game, that lets you lose the locations of survivors far away from you to work out the location of the box. Barbecue and Chili is a better box finding tool than Lethal Pursuer or Hoarder and you can't convince me otherwise. If you know where survivors are consistently with barbecue, you can use that to work out where the box is likely to spawn because you not just see where the survivors are, but where they aren't. If the box is only just spawned from when you hook someone, it's likely to be in a negative space far from your hook and from the remaining survivors, so you can just tootle on over there to activate it. Alternatively, if it's been a bit longer, there's a good chance you'll see someone moving over to the box or running around with it trying to find somewhere to solve, allowing you to potentially contest that solve. Which brings me nicely to the section of this video where I talk about builds. I'm going to preface this by saying that one of the most appealing parts of Pinhead is how many different perk builds you can run with him. He loops relatively normally, and thus benefits from chase perks like Brutal Strength. It exclusively uses basic attacks and thus works with exposed perks. Synergize is exceptionally well with both general aggression perks and information perks, and even has inbuilt totem defences. Much like another new killer, you can pretty much run anything on him and it'll usually be alright. There's one particular synergy that I think can't be overlooked, and that's Hex Ruin. Really, this one shouldn't be surprising, as any killer with good map pressure can become really gnarly with Ruin. But Pinhead does it a little differently than most. While killers like Blight, Nurse, or Freddy get Ruin value because they decided they were going to exist in the generator, Pinhead gets most of his rewards from Ruin because of the Lament configuration. If a survivor has to leave a generator to go and solve the box, that both wastes time that can be spent looking for and breaking the hex, and causes Ruin to eat the generator they're working on while they're off solving. Not to mention what happens when a chain hunt starts while Ruin is up. Since the chain waves are so frequent that you physically won't be able to do the Ruin totem, and stick on it long enough for it to break between waves. And between the constant incapacitation and the likely risk of Pinhead starting to tear through the team, pushing out generators becomes much harder, and Ruin's likely to eat through the gens even more. Ruin feeds the box, the box feeds Ruin, and harassing people with personal chains helps with both. Building around Ruin is the core of any effective Pinhead build in my opinion. As my second slowdown perk of choice, I used to run Pop Goes the Weasel as a backup plan in case my Ruin broke. But I've recently found a new favourite plaything in Scourge Hook Pain Resonance. For losing only 10% regression, Pain Resonance lets you regress the generator through Ruin and removes the travel time needed to use Pop. Replacing the inconsistency of not being able to get pop value with the somewhat lesser inconsistency of not being able to always have a scourge hook on hand. Nevertheless, the perk is both a fine backup in case your ruin gets taken out of commission and a fantastic support perk to ruin, so it slots nicely into the build. Throw on barbecue and chili for its unique utility on Pinhead that we discussed earlier, and then we have a perk slot to fill up with whatever you want. You could run extra slowdown, 
or use this perk for Hoarder, or even an endgame perk like No Way Out. But I like to run a Chase or Lethality perk in that slot. Say the best for last, Hex Devour Hope, Hex Haunted Ground, or my personal favourite, Brutal Strength. Yeah, just nice, simple, brutal. It's consistent, handy, and just feels good to use. Pinhead is the kind of killer that survivors love to pre-drop against, and it helps you catch back up after breaking the pallet just a little bit faster, especially if your chain is on cooldown. Like, sure, Devour is a very good perk and all, but survivors are more conscious of totem spawns than ever. I don't think a hex that does nothing at the start of the match is really worth it, when there are so many perks to choose from in that slot. Haunted is a bit better, but also quite inconsistent. Yeah, they'll probably break it, but unless you're already in a chase with someone healthy when it breaks, I found it to not be that great, since you're not a killer with the ability to get into a chase quickly as soon as it procs. And save? Well, yeah, save's a good catch-up tool when it works out, but if you're looking to keep the box under your control, the obsession can and often will just keep going for the box to keep your stacks down. It's a perk that's a lot more awkward on Pinhead than it is on other killers, because to some degree the survivors get to control who you chase. So this here is my current Pinhead perk loadout, and one that I'd recommend for a well-rounded and fairly chill but still powerful build. But would I call it the best Pinhead build per se? No. Well, for that I'd have to show you what I called the Subtweet build. I'm calling it this because I've gotten subtweeted many times already just from running the build. It's a slowdown heavy build, designed in large part to counter the boon totem meta by making the placement of boons much more awkward. The core of the build is Hex Ruin, Hex Thrill of the Hunt, and Hex Pentimento. For those who aren't aware, Hex Thrill of the Hunt got buffed in the Arrow of the Witch mid chapter to also increase boon perk blessing speed, so it takes survivors 28 seconds to bless a dull totem through Thrill of the Hunt, and 56 seconds to bless a lit Hex. This makes Thrill effectively the only counter to boon perks that killers have in their arsenal. And populating as many of the token spawns with hexes printed by Thrill is a great way to discourage survivors from spending almost a full minute blessing. As such, the subtweet build consists of Hex Ruin, Hex Undying, Hex Thrill of the Hunt, and Hex Pentimento. There is a level of flexibility to the build. I know when Ostava picked the build up, he decided to run Devour Hope over Undying, or you could throw Haunted Ground or even Retribution in that fourth hex slot. But I like Undying for the raw consistency it has in protecting both the Thrill of the Hunt and your Ruin to maximise the time sink spent into getting rid of them. Because let's explore a hypothetical scenario for a team going against this build. They want to get rid of the Ruin, right? So they find a lit totem, and because of Thrill of the Hunt, they spend 28 seconds cleansing it. Because they're not going to spend a minute blessing a totem this early into the match. Regardless of which hex they find, Undying takes the hit and breaks in its place. Then when you rekindle the hex with Pentimento, suddenly the gens are going 30% slower on top of Ruin's regression, meaning they now have to find both the Ruin and put the Pentimento back out. But Thrill of the Hunt is still up, meaning breaking each one will take even longer. And for each other totem they break trying to get rid of the Ruin, you can just rekindle another Pentimento to replace it and force them to spend even more time cleansing totems, potentially with Thrill of the Hunt still strangling their cleansing speed. If survivors find the Ruin before the Thrill, they have to go through Undying, Ruin, and Pentimento twice before you get rid of the Ruin, all of which will be protected by Thrill of the Hunt's additional cleansing speed penalty. And if the survivors find the Thrill first, then they're going to have to break four totems, three of them through Thrill of the Hunt, and Ruin will still be up which you will place with a third Pentimento Totem once they do break it. This build forces survivors to do an absolutely hideous amount of legwork to remove all your slowdown, since they'll have to cleanse at minimum 4 Totems through Thrill of the Hunt, and a maximum of 6 Totems, 3 of which are through Thrill, throwing the Dement configuration that they'll have to spend time getting off generators and off of Totems to solve, and your ability to remotely disrupt Totems with Possessed Chains and the Chain Hunt, and you effectively overload the survivor team's priorities, forcing the survivors to potentially spend minutes breaking hexes while Ruin eats their gen progress, whilst on top of the event configuration and doing all the gens. Your suffering will be legendary even in hell. Side note, this is not a pinhead exclusive build by any means. 
it's pretty damn great on any killer who can use Ruin half decently. Especially if they're scared of boon totems. That's why I'm running it on twins right now. Because they struggle so hard against Circle of Healing and Exponential, any build that incentivizes the survivors to cleanse totems by spending a minute blessing through Thrill, while also running perks that work well with twins like Ruin, why would you not? If anything, I'd argue this build is overkill on Pinhead, since you don't really fear booms as much as many other killers, and you already have inbuilt game delay anyway. This leaves the only thing worth talking about to be the add-ons, and that's actually why I was so slow making this guide. I wanted to wait until the mid-chapter patch arrived and we got a good look at Pinhead's nerfed add-ons. And I gotta say, I'm not a massive fan of many of the nerfs. Yeah, Engineer's Fang needed to get nerfed in a 12 second solve time with both solve add-ons was kind of absurd and did need to be changed, but I don't think the changes they received were the right ones at all. First of all, the passive chain hunt add-ons and the iridescent net configuration did not need nerfs. Those add-ons were fine. Eri config was powerful and a healthy iridescent add-on, and while it's still pretty decent, it's a shadow of what it used to be, even though it really wasn't overpowered. I'd have called it one of the best ultra rare add-on designs in recent memory, and Torture Pillar and Burning Candle getting nerfed is just puzzling. Apparently it's because they were commonly used, but like, no shit? The chain turn rate and chain range add-ons are just kinda crap, half pub add-ons are pretty terrible, and gateway range add-ons were nice but overshadowed by solve time. So of course people were just jamming Torture Pillar because it was a good add-on on a sea of mad ones, I know I was. Speaking of solve time, the old combination of liquefied gore and Larry's remains brought the time taken to solve the event configuration from 6 seconds to 12 seconds, and that increase was quite a bit too good. So ultimately I'm glad those add-ons got nerfed. That being said, I can't help but think base solve time is still too low to justify not running at least one solve time add-on, in most cases anyway. So if it was up to me, I'd have buffed the base solve time from 6 seconds to 7 to compensate slightly for the nerf and reduce Pinhead's dependency on solve time add-ons. With that change, liquefied gore would remain what it was on release, a very reasonable 8 second solve. 10 seconds was the length it took to solve the mech configuration with just Larry's remains before the nerf, and in my opinion it's the longest a solve should ever have to take. But I have the most to say about the Engineer's Fang nerf, because much as I love Pinhead, I viscerally despise Engineer's Fang. It's such a lazy add-on design, just stapling a broken effect onto something that was never designed to have it, much like Iridescent Head or Compound 33. Engineers is a fundamentally unfair design. It rewards the pinhead too much for just landing a chain and breaks the concept of his power at its core, to the point that it needs a borderline crippling downside to be even remotely balanced. Engineers Fang needed more than just the nerf it got. It needed, and still needs, a full reconstruction, a rework. No matter what you do to it, Fang is a bad design conceptually. It just needs to be discarded and started again. Here's what my design for an iridescent pinhead add-on would look like. Whenever a chain hunt is manually started by pinhead, by him activating the box or picking it up from the ground, all survivors become exposed 20 seconds on a 10 second delay. It would reward the pinhead with lethality, something that he does struggle with, for good box control. Something the survivors can prevent with good coordination. But yeah, let's stop talking about what I would change and talk about the current situation with Pinhead's add-ons. Right now he's got a few pretty good ones and sadly quite a lot of garbage. The worst add-ons right now are Impaling Wire, Greasy Black Lens, Gateway Range and Solve Time. My personal favourite and in my opinion the GOAT of Pinhead add-ons being Impaling Wire. Impaling Wire helps Pinhead in chase where he's the most vulnerable, in enclosed spaces where the survivors can break chains in the environment easily. It makes it so that if a chain breaks on the environment, two waves of support chains will spawn instead of one. Since the follow-up support chains typically aren't known for their accuracy, two chains let you replace quality with quantity and quickly re-swarm the survivors. Greasy Black Lens is also very nice in the chase as it shows you the aura of anyone you snare with a possessed chain, making mind gaming at pallets a breeze for as long as they remain chained. It's a particularly nice combo with Engineer's Fang, it shows you the aura when they get injured so you can easily follow up and get them down. Get your range and solve time for first similar functions to each other. They allow Pinhead to artificially increase his reach to more easily harass someone when testing the box. Solve time gives Pinhead more time to get into position and deploy his gateway before the box is solved, and gateway range mitigates the requirement to walk to that right position in the first place by allowing to place the gateway further away, 
and close enough to the survivor to land the chain on them even if they're far away. Both add-ons have extra utility beyond the circumstance. Gateway range lets you do other things like gateway for info or harass totems or heal from further away, and solve time makes it more likely you'll be able to teleport to someone if they try to solve a box while you're carrying. If I want to run strong add-ons on Pinhead, I'll usually run one of each of these, or only one plus impaling wire. Passive chain hunt timer add-ons and eerie config are still decent, especially config, but since the nerfs they're not quite what they once were, and the cooldown add-ons black strap and skewered rat aren't necessarily great but they do feel good to use, so if you're not sure what to run do try them out. I'd recommend starting pinhead players try out passive chain hunt and chain cooldown add-ons. Instead don't massively change how you play, but let you experiment with interesting new opportunities to use your power more consistently. That leaves the Possessed Chain Manipulation add-ons, the Garbage Purples and the Meme add-on. Don't run these, please. The Meme add-on is a meme. Chatter has two turns off the Chain Hunt and Original Pain does nothing unless you plow an old legioning someone to death by forcing them to walk with a deep wound. But the really horrible ones are Chain Turn Rate or Chain Range. If you find yourself in need of these add-ons, that's a sign you probably need to improve your gate replacement. Not only are these add-ons just not very good compared to gateway range, turn rate will mess with the muscle memory, and both add-ons basically let you do anything if you miss your gateway really badly. And you should simply just not do that in the first place. Shit, wait, I almost forgot Slice of Frank. Slice of Frank is actually better than it looks. Don't get me wrong, it's not a great add-on, and I think Pinhead is add-on dependent enough that running it over an actually good add-on is not going to feel good, it does have its uses. But notably, if you're chasing somebody who's carrying the box, they can't use their dead hard, because let's be completely honest here, they're a survivor in Dead by Daylight, they've got dead hard. And because survivors typically solve the box when they're healthy rather than when they're injured, this will also turn off Overcome. Sadly, those are basically the only uses, but they are not nothing. So I think it's a decent add-on. Kind of. And on that note, that's basically everything I have to say about Pinhead's add-ons and therefore the killer. So if you want my closing thoughts on the killer, then I think he's great. I'll be honest, I think Pinhead was by far the best release of 2021 and one of the best parts about Dead by Daylight in the last year. That does not mean he's perfect, and it doesn't mean that I've moved on from twins or anything, I'm still the twins guy through and through, but I think Pinhead was one of the best releases we've had in a very, very long time. He's powerful but fair, his kit has a decent balance of 1v1 and 1v4 skill expression, and his learning curve is super rewarding with a ton of stuff that you'll figure out and learn to master. I've been playing him since he came out, I'm still learning things that I had to sort out for this guy. But I did say he isn't perfect, so here's what I would do to change him. Number one, fix the stupid bug where survivors get harassed by chains while they're solving. That's really dumb and shouldn't exist, and honestly, they said they'd fixed it and they hadn't, which is a massive disaster and something they should be prioritising as soon as they come back from their Christmas break. It makes playing against Pinhead far more annoying than it needs to be, and bulking out the solve time by having to solve maybe two or three times leaves you up playing the killer on easy mode, something I've always had disdain for. And as I said earlier, I would also buff base solve time by one second, but leave the actual sort of add-ons unchanged, revert the nerfs to torture pillar, burning candle, iridescent lament configuration, rework engineer's fang completely, and buff or rework several other add-ons, namely Original Pain, Chatterer's Tooth, the Chain Range add-ons, and Bent Nail. There are other things you could try, like making Pinhead not break his own chains for example, but honestly, I'd say he's quite a low priority for changes. Between killers that punish survivors for being anywhere on the map at all, killers that have been shadow nerfed, power crept and bugged out so many times they're barely usable anymore, and killers who just straight up don't do anything, Pinhead is actually kind of fine. The Soul Harass bug is the only thing about him that I would say is a high priority fix, but aside from that, there's a lot of other killers who need the attention before he does. Although the portrait of a murder mid-chapter is coming fairly soon, meaning that it would be Pinhead's second mid-chapter, which is the normal time that killers will get changed. Granted, Pinhead has already had changes, so he might not have more, but this is probably the last window he'll have to get changed for quite some time. So we'll have to see what they do with him, if anything. A lot of survivors, I'm sure, would love to see Pinhead get gutted in that kind of mid-chapter. But, um, don't have to put this kindly, but I really don't care what you think. Pinhead is a very fair killer by every reasonable metric. But if you don't like that, then I'm afraid that's what they call a you problem. And nothing else, it actually makes total sense for a character like Pinhead. 
Pleasure and Pain, Indivisible. Okay, that's the end of the video, and I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you. Because this year has been one of the best years of my life, if not the best year of my life. Because this has all kind of began. At the end of December 2020, I hit exactly a thousand subscribers, and I'd made it my goal to hit 15k by the end of 2021. And I've gotten well over double that. I'll be moving in the next month or two to live off my channel full time, and part of that is going to involve streaming again, because I haven't been able to stream much, if at all, over the past several months. I've already started playing lots of new videos and some really cool collaborations, which I cannot wait to share with you guys. This does mean I'm probably going to be taking videos at a slightly slower pace before the move, so do bear that in mind. If my uploads start to slow down a little bit in the next month or two, that is why, because I'm prepping for the move. But in any case, I cannot express enough how incredibly grateful I am for this past year, because it's given me a whole new lease of life, and I can't wait to see what next year is going to bring. Thank you Roby for giving the voice to everyone's favourite crypto bro, Kirk Rockwell. His channel link is in the description, but I highly doubt you knew the introduction from me. I'm just so excited for what's going to be happening next year, and I can't wait to share it with you. Have a wonderful 2022, and I'll see you next time. Ta-ta for now.